Over this past number of weeks, we have been following a series which we have entitled Grace Works, which has been thinking about how the, the grace of God either works for us, what God has done uh, very objectively for us at times, maybe that he has saved us, uh, things like that. Or we have been thinking about how the, the grace of God works in us so that it produces certain characteristics which we recognize is the proof, as it were, of what God is doing in our lives. So we're, we're finishing off that series today, but today's almost a bit of a, a, a pivot of change. After this, we're going to be moving to look at some stories from Mark's gospel over the next number of weeks. But today I'm going to use a, a story from Mark's gospel to round off this series, which is just thinking about how the, the grace of God works in our lives. And the angle that I'm taking from that, it's almost like if Mark is trying to describe for you in words how God's grace works, he may feel at some point, says, I don't just have the right words to be able to do this. And what he then presents in Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, is a couple of stories, a couple of real life pictures, as it were, which are, if you were maybe in a maths class and saying, here's a worked example about how to do that. Well, that's what these stories are. They are worked examples of faith. And the encouragement is, if you want to find faith, here's something real that you can look at. See what happened in these people's lives. And this is what, this is what God did. So that's where we're going today. Um, I'm just going to read uh, one verse and then I'm going to hand over to Tom at, at this point from Psalm 33. And in Psalm 33, we've got this encouragement. Uh, all that we need to do is to rest, trust, rely on God. That's not our natural inclination because I think by and large, we are much more comfortable if we can rely on ourselves because we think I've got what it takes to get done whatever needs done. And, and so the imagery here might be a little bit outdated in that it's all about war horses and fighting and strength. You get the idea. You might rather rely on those things because you might think you're in control, but actually it's about relying on God. And that's what the psalmist says here. It says, the best equipped army can't save a king nor is great strength enough to save a warrior. Don't count on your war horse to give you victory. For all its strength, it cannot save you. But the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. I want to turn to that passage in Mark's Gospel. I said I was going to, to read earlier. If you turn with me, please, to Mark chapter 5. And you'll find this reading on page 1007. Mark chapter 5. We're going to begin to read at verse 21. And let's hear God's word. When Jesus had crossed again over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered round him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed round him. And a, a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, 
Her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned round in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kuam, which means, little girl, I tell you to get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. And at this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. And we pray that the Lord would add his blessing to his word. Uh, maybe just pause in a moment's prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we come that we might meet around your word. We come that we might encounter you afresh. We come as imperfect followers. We come as those whose faith is not always strong, but we come as people who might like to have stronger faith. And so, Lord, we pray that you might take your word, your truth, and you might speak to our hearts today for our encouragement. And we pray in our Savior's name. Amen. Quite often we've been told that a picture can paint a thousand words where perhaps those words are inadequate. That's the sense that I was trying to get at the very outset of the service today. And it's with that that we come to these words, which I believe are carefully arranged by Mark to present a story and to say something to you. It's like Mark is struggling to describe faith and he's now saying, look at these two people, these two individuals. And furthermore, he's saying to us, if you're wanting to find faith, if you're wanting to journey, as it were, closer to Jesus, look closely at what you find in these couple of individuals. So as we turn to this passage, we're, we're, we are introduced to two, two individuals. One of them goes by the name of Jairus. If you're looking at this passage here, what we can learn about Jairus is that he is significant, he is important, he's not only a, one of the ordinary religious leaders of the day, but he's, he's really one of the, the, the top guys in, in the synagogue, people uh, that people others would respect. And it's more noticeable, I think, what's going on here in Jesus' encounter with him, because up to this point, Jesus has not really made any headway with any of the religious establishment. They've all been against him. And so recognizing that this was a Jewish leader, an important individual, you can imagine the shock that the people around about might experience, might witness 
when they try and imagine what happens in verse 22 and 23. It says, Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, and he pleaded earnestly with him. Because these guys, these leaders, were not accustomed to falling at people's feet. They're not accustomed to, to pleading with anyone, never mind Jesus. So it's quite shocking what we see here. But what I also want you to understand about Jairus, that even though he comes to meet Jesus, we're not really presented with Jairus as being someone who has got great faith. He's not really a wonderful example of faith. I think the best way to describe Jairus here is that Jairus is in the last chance saloon, if that's the, the picture to describe it. Uh, his daughter is dying, and when your daughter is dying, you will do anything, anything, to try and remedy that situation. So that's how we're introduced to Jairus. And then in the midst of the hustle and bustle of all the people who are there, and then if you look closely at verses 25 and then down again to verse 31, what, what we sense there is just the sheer numbers of people who are pressing in upon Jesus. So there's hardly room to move. And it's then that we're introduced then to the second person in this story. And it's the woman variously uh, described here as, as a sick woman, sometimes the woman with the issue of blood. So it's a, a lady who has been hemorrhaging for 12 years. And she is described as being physically wrecked. And she's not only physically wrecked because of her condition, which is terrible, but also because of the cures that she was trying to take to, to remedy her illness. So it's described here that she has spent all her money going to doctors or going to all the quacks of the, the day to try and get cured. What's worse for this woman is it's not simply that she's physically unwell, but she would have been excluded because of her condition. She wouldn't be allowed to go into the synagogue. She wouldn't be allowed to worship with God's people. Uh, anything that she touched would be regarded as ceremonially unclean. If she had been married, it's quite likely by this point she would have been divorced, or at least there's grounds. For, that was one of the grounds for divorce back in, in, in this day. And that's the condition that this lady has, which is really quite horrific. And as she comes now to Jesus, there's a sense that her only hope, it's a strange bit of hope, looking at verse 28, here's, here's her thinking. It says, well, verse 27, it says, she came up and she touched his cloak. And in verse 28, because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. So it was, believe it or not, a common superstitious belief in these days, that touching the clothes of a holy individual would be enough to heal you, or even to allow the shadow of a holy man who is walking past you to allow that shadow to fall upon yourself might be enough to heal you. So what we have in this, these few verses that are presented to us today by Mark are two case studies, two individuals, Two stories that he wants to show you about faith, but as I've been telling you in this past few minutes, they're not exactly great examples of faith. For one of them, it's the last chance saloon. And for the other one, I think the lady, we can really only describe her as, it's a bit, it's a bit like a magic foot, but rabbit's foot. That's nothing more than that. If I can touch his clothes, I'm going to be healed. So what can we actually learn from this story? What does Mark want you to know? There are a couple of common features in this. I'm going to try and draw those out. The first one, and I think it's quite clear, is what they have and what they share in common is a sense of desperation. There's no one else to whom they can turn. And they're only coming to Jesus as the last gasp effort, as it were. 
And I don't know about you. For all of us as we go through moments, situations, events in life, sometimes there are those occurrences that happen that probably we would rather not have to go through. But it is those moments that make us realize that we're desperate because we can't cure ourselves. We can't fix this situation ourselves. And in our desperation, and it's that sense of desperation that God actually uses so that we then begin to reach out to him. And when we spiritually then begin to make a connection with God, that the root of it probably has been some issue, some problem, some moment that God is actually beginning to say, I'm going to use this so that it makes you unsure. It's going to make you unsteady. The result of that means that you realize there is nothing that you can do to remedy this yourself, and you're going to need to reach out to me, and that God uses those situations. Those situations can be many. They can be varied. It may be that in your working life, it hasn't gone the way that you might want it to, and that that causes a certain soul-searching, and a wondering within yourself so that you wonder what is this about and that you begin to think is there more to really than what I thought was normal on what was the the, the concert or the, the fulfillment of life and I'm looking for that in the wrong direction and that God begins to speak to you through that it might be something in even more tragic it could be an illness that begins to unsettle you it could be even a friendship that has gone wrong, someone has pulled away from you, and in the uncertainty of those moments, it makes you question these things, and in the questioning of these things, you begin to reach out to God for the very first time. It could be something even with your family, with your kids. You're reaching the end of your tether. You don't know how to fix your kids. You don't know how to deal with what's going on in your family life, and all these things, you begin to reach out. And in that sense of desperation, you can understand what is happening in this passage because that is what God has been using for Jairus and for this woman as they reach the end of their tether and that they realize they can't fix themselves and it's someone else who's able to do that. And that sense of desperation is what brings you to Jesus. And it could be right now the changes in your life, the, the events, the daily happenings or what's been going on, it makes you wonder and makes you think and you begin to consider, is this something that God is trying to make me go in a different direction that I need to reach out to God and that God is doing this and God is behind this? And God can do that and God can be presenting himself to you, that I can come into your life. And this needs to change. But at the same time, we do need to recognize that we don't simply come to Jesus for the gifts that he gives us or how he fixes things in our lives. So we can't say to Jesus, look, Jesus, I'll come to you. I'll become a Christian. I'll follow you if you fix this thing that's wrong in my life. What we need to learn is that we need to see Jesus for who Jesus is, not for what Jesus can actually give us. If you imagine that illustration that's used so often about a toddler getting a huge big present and it comes in a great big box and the toddler actually gets more obsessed and more enjoyment out of the box and they forget the actual gift that's been given. We mustn't make the same mistake when we come to Jesus that we mustn't get more obsessed by what Jesus can give us but rather we need to see and be thankful for Jesus for who he is and recognize that Jesus is our very salvation and that Jesus is our chief joy and in our desperation we come and we meet Jesus himself because there is no one else who can give us what we really need, and that's our salvation. I want you to think about the particular situation 
where Jesus encounters the woman at this point. And there's something that's almost frightening in that encounter. When you consider it from this angle, think of the numbers of people who were there. You can see the surprise that's mentioned of the disciples in verse 31, where Jesus asks the question, who touched me? Because the disciples are saying, what do you mean who touched me? That's a daft question. Everybody's touching me. But as you think about that moment, for all the people that were there, for all the people who were crowding in upon Jesus, who is the one who actually encountered Jesus? Just this one lady. So there were loads of people there, but the one who made this deep connection with Jesus was this one lady. And it's a reminder, I think, to all of us at times that we can be about Jesus, we can be going to church, we can be admiring Jesus, we can be, in that sense, even close to Jesus, but we still miss out on who Jesus is. And so we can be here, we can be along for the ride, as it were, at times, but we need to actually encounter Jesus. And we mustn't confuse being around Jesus, being interested in Jesus, and actually meeting Jesus and finding that Jesus is our Savior and understanding that we have made Jesus the Savior of our lives. So these two people, and I've already been saying they've got pretty rubbish faith at the start of the story. One of them, it's the last chance saloon. The other one, it's a, it's a lucky rabbit's foot. But the other thing that I think they share in common is that truly they are both on a journey of discovery. Is that there, there's a movement here that they learn more about Jesus as the story progresses. When the lady encounters Jesus, he was already moving towards Jairus' house. Jairus was impressing upon everyone, my daughter's dying, I need to get Jesus to come. And Jesus was moving in that direction. And so when this anonymous woman reaches out and touches Jesus' clothes, Jesus easily could have just walked on because he was in a hurry to get to Jairus' house. And certainly Jairus would have wanted him to do that. There was an urgency in doing that, but Jesus doesn't follow on that urgency. He stops and he starts to ask around, who touched my clothes? The disciples are wondering, what are you talking about? Everybody's around here. Why does he spend so much time trying to find out who this person is who touched his clothes? Because he recognizes there was some strange connection between the two. He sensed the power going out from him. He recognized that there was someone who did it. Why does he stop? And it's because, surely, he wants this woman to encounter Jesus in a new way so that she is not under any illusion, but that she knows it's not a magic superstition that has saved her, that has cured her, but it is Jesus himself. And what Jesus wants to happen in this woman's life is that she is able to see Jesus and she's able to connect with Jesus, and that she moves closer to Jesus, and so she is on this journey. And in some ways, the same happens with Jairus. Whenever finally they get to Jairus' house, when Jesus gets there, he throws everybody else out of the house. He says, get out! And he takes his three disciples, and he takes Jairus, Jairus and his wife, into the room. And we could ask the question, why does he take this small number into that room? And the reason that he's doing that is because, again, he wants them to be 100% crystal clear. It's me who's doing this. He wants them to see Jesus and that Jesus is the one who has done this. So even though their faith may be weak and their faith may be faltering, Jesus is saying the important thing is that your faith is in me, the one you can see, the one who is standing in front of you. I want you to see me. 
And that's important for us to realize as we look at these people, their faith wasn't perfect. It was pretty rubbish at the start. And that's an encouragement to you because your faith at times is pretty rubbish. At times you may feel pretty wick about your faith. But the thing is, it makes no difference. We always hear this. It makes no difference the amount of faith you have. It's who it's in makes all the difference. So even though people will say, and I'm sure you've heard things like, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe with all your heart, that's nonsense. Or maybe when you've gone through a terrible situation, you have come out the other side of it, someone recognizes that you're a Christian and they look at you slightly enviously and they will say things like, oh, I wish I had your faith. Again, that's a load of nonsense because it makes no difference how much faith you have. The significant bit is who your faith is in. It's Jesus. I'm sure I've used this story before. I remember being on a roller coaster ride and the problem with being in a family of five, or at least in those days we were still a family of five, um, there's always an odd person when there's a two-person ride. So I'm stuck on the ride by myself, which means a randomer then comes and sits beside you. And normally that's all right, but sometimes you get a weird one. <laughs> and on this occasion, there was a young guy sat beside me. And that seemed okay at the start until the thing started to move. Now, this was, if anyone knows Rock and Roller Coaster, this, no, it wasn't Rock and Roller, but Rip Ride Rocket, which is pretty horrific. And it goes straight up and then it's going to come straight down. Like, I'm sitting there and I'm reasonably relaxed. But this guy beside me starts to squeal and shout. He literally did. We're going to die. We're going to die. And he's beginning to reach and hold the side and touch my arm, which I'm not happy with at all. <laughs> but what he needs to know, I mean, it makes no difference. I mean, we're both there side by side. I maybe have a slightly more confidence in the ride. He has got no confidence in, in, in the, the ride and what's going to happen. But at the end of the day, we both survived. We both came out the other side because it makes no difference the confidence that you have. It's what it's in. And so it is with Jesus. And as I, as I look at this passage, and maybe drill down even a little bit more so that you might be encouraged I'm reminding you again, it makes no difference the amount of faith that you have or how weak your faith might be and how disappointed you might be at times with your own faith. I'm sure you have said something like this. I've sinned. I've sinned again. And I wonder if God can still be patient with me. I'm sure you've said that. Well, I want you to know that God still has a purpose for you because it is not the amount of faith that you have, it's who it, your faith is in. It's in Jesus. And Jesus has promised by his death and the merits of that to pay the price for your sin. They are gone and it does not depend on you. It depends on him. So saying things like, I wonder if God has purpose for my life, that's a nonsense because God does. Or if you're thinking today that I'm finding it hard to trust in Jesus right now because of what's going on, I'm struggling, I'm finding it hard, and you're feeling weak because of that, because of the buffeting, look at Jairus in this situation. He's, a new, he's as it were, encountering Jesus in a new way here, and, he, and he's... And he's following Jesus as best he can and he's, and he's walking with Jesus towards his house and then someone comes up and they, and they say to him, it's too late. There's no point bringing Jesus because your daughter's dead. What a, what a thing to endure. He's only very new in following Jesus as it were and then all these tragedies start to come into his life and Jesus says, don't worry. Just believe. Let's go. And so they go off and they follow after Jesus because it makes no difference the amount of faith you have. It's who it's in. 
And I want you to know that this teaching of Mark here is centered around illness and death so that you can know that Jesus paid the price, the ultimate price, for your ultimate sickness, which is death. And Jesus died on the cross for that. He took your sickness, he took your death, he defeated it on the cross, and he offers you eternal life. And today, you may be a little bit wary of following Jesus, a little bit hesitant about following Jesus. You, you may feel I don't have what it takes to fully follow Jesus. I've got very imperfect faith, but Jesus is reminding you he takes you as you are. Jesus reaches out to you. And there's one last little thing I really want to draw out of this passage just now. If you turn with me to verse 41. And as I turn to verse 41, I'm going to ask you the question, what language was the New Testament written in? The New Testament was written in Greek. But as you turn to verse 41, there are two words in the middle of it that are not in Greek. And you would say, why are these words then written in a different language in the middle of that? Now you look at it, verse 41, it says, he took her by the hand and he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I tell you, dig it up. Now the reason those words are in Aramaic, because those are the words that Jesus actually said. He didn't speak in Greek, he was speaking Aramaic, so those are the words that Jesus actually said in that moment. That's why they're written in Aramaic. And what those words mean is, well, technically it's just this little girl. It's the word to describe a little girl. Now, it's not, no, that seems very remote, little girl. Like, little girl, could you pass me a bottle of ketchup or whatever it is? But actually, there's a very specific use for this phrase, little girl. And it was, the, this is the word that a Palestinian mother would use when she comes into her daughter's bedroom first thing in the morning to get them up for school. So it's that sense of closeness and tenderness and love and care and compassion. So Jesus takes this little girl by the hand and he calls her Talitha Kuam, little girl, get up. So he's taking the place of the girl's mother, as it were, signifying the sense of touch and compassion and care. And this sense of touch is important in this section in Mark's gospel, because if you remember, back with the lady who had the issue of blood, she was the one who reached out and touched Jesus' garments. So we're reiterating this sense of touch. And what Mark is trying to get across, it's about reaching out and laying hold and touching Jesus and reaching out to him and finding his compassion and tenderness and love and care. And what you're meant to know at the end of this is that Jesus doesn't want to be remote from you. Jesus doesn't want to be a savior who is distant, but he is one who has compassion for you. That Jesus is one who is near to you. Jesus is one who is reaching out to you. Jesus is one who wants to make a difference in your life. And he wants, as it were, to come to you and to speak to you and say, wake up, come near to me. So maybe if you have been following Jesus for a while, but you've been finding it hard and you feel that you're a bit of a reject and that you're only a 50% Christian because you haven't been as strong or as good as you think you should be and you've disappointed yourself, never mind disappointing God, you should find encouragement in the Saviour who draws near and takes you by the hand and touches you and wants to be close. Or on the other hand, it may be that you are maybe slightly dif distant from Jesus because you've never actually made that first step. But in your sense of desperation, you recognize that you need him and that you need to start along that journey of discovery as you find Jesus, as you encounter Jesus, as you know that Jesus is your savior. So the encouragement here is to find Jesus, to reach out and touch him. If I can help you in any way, if you're unsure about any of this, you want to start afresh with Jesus, come and speak to me. Because we 
in church, we want you to know Jesus. We want you to meet Jesus. We want you to find this Savior. We want you to know that he is the one you desperately need. Let's just pray. Lord Jesus, reach out to us. Reach out and take hold of us. Touch our lives and that we will know the Lord is real. Lord, thank you for the encouragement that it's not about the strength of our faith, but it's simply leaning on you. And so, Lord, we lean on you today. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.